Alrighty, hi, this is Gary Collins, the creator of the Primal Power Method, and I am here with Dr. Cordain, the author of The Paleo Diet. Uh, thanks for coming on today, Dr. Cordain. I appreciate it. Hey, Gary, it's my pleasure, and feel free just to call me Laura. I, okay, I will. Thanks a lot. Uh, with, with the Paleo Diet, some people are, are new to it and unfamiliar. W would you kind of explain where the premise for it came from? Yeah, I, I, I sure would. I'm, I've just retired from Colorado State University. I'm 63 years old, and I've been studying this concept for most of my academic life. And I got involved with it in the early 80s, and paleo stands for paleolithic. Paleo means old, lithic means stone age. And so what paleolithic means is the old stone age. And that period goes from about two and a half million years ago until about 10,000 years ago. And during that period, all humans subsisted as hunter-gatherers. We all foraged, hunted, <laughs> and gathered the food that we ate from our environment. And so those were um, unadulterated wild plant and animal foods. So the concept in the 21st century is to try to mimic or emulate nutritional characteristics of the foods that our ancestors ate. And so they ate wild plants, fresh fruits, vegetables, wild animals, uh, meats, seafood, fish, eggs, what have you, from their environment. And they didn't eat grains, they didn't eat processed foods, processed sugars, uh, processed vegetable oils, or any of the foods that comprise about 70% of the calories in the typical U.S. diet. Okay. So, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just saying, okay, that's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, what would you say, then, are the core principles of the paleo diet template? I, I think what it is is to try to emulate or mimic the nutritional characteristics that shape the current human genome. And obviously, no humans ever ate white bread or donuts or, you know, any of the foods that, like I said, 70% of the calories, refined sugars, refined grains, refined vegetable oils and dairy products, that, those four food groups represent 70% of the calories in the typical, typical U.S. diet. And so my point is, is that if we can replace those foods with real living foods with, you know, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, meats, seafood, uh, eggs, and nuts, then what it does is it tends to uh, displace those empty calories that we get from processed foods, and it improves the nutritional qualities of our lives. So. That's really the emphasis, and that's what this whole thing's all about. Yeah. Are, are there any foods that are definitely not allowed while on the paleo diet? You know what? We, Gary, we live in the 21st century, and uh, I don't know about you, but you're constantly exposed as, as anyone else to the Western world, and you you have pizza and beer and what have you. And so the idea here is to try to, you know, minimize the intake of those processed foods and, and eat, you know, more natural foods. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, it's a very valid point that some people seem to forget at times because uh, we've been, a lot of us have never really even seen a farm in America today during our lifetime it's how far removed we are from food so explaining to them there was no Krispy Kremes and you know uh, Winchell's Donuts and Starbucks in you know the Paleolithic period you know trying to make them understand you actually had to go get your food you had to go hunt it you had to gather it 
So yeah, I mean, uh, but we are in a modern society, so there there does have to be some sort of balance. Would you say with the paleo diet, uh, is is the ultimate goal since it's about being healthy and obviously for most of us weight loss, uh, is the ultimate goal kind of controlling your blood sugar? Would you say? I mean, I'm Gary. I think you brought up some really good questions and. You know, when I first started researching this, my intent never was to make this a contemporary or popular weight loss diet. I think that's the model that has been used throughout the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years of popular diets is that let's do something that we can lose weight with. And... The idea that I always had was never to lose weight necessarily, but rather was to improve health and reduce risk of chronic disease. Yeah, I always tell people that's, uh, you know, when I work with one-on-one, is that we're not here for the main goal of losing weight. That just happens to be one of the side benefits of becoming healthy. Um, and exactly. And, I, and Gary, I think, you know, you as a practitioner and, and everyone else in the paleo sphere realizes that when people eat in this manner when they take processed foods out of their diet, and 70% of the calories, refined sugar, refined grains, refined vegetable oils, and you can pack it together in any kind of product you want, a donut, you know, a cracker, a pancake, you name it. That's how you make these processed foods. And when we eliminate those processed foods and we start focusing on real foods, on the foods that are in the outside aisle of the supermarket, uh, you know, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, seafood, fish, meats, what have you, uh, you know, people naturally start to, their body weight starts to gravitate to where it, it should be. And so it's impossible to have 250 pound males. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, that's a line in most football days. You can't build 250 pound males without refined carbohydrates and crap. You can't make women that are 600 pounds with those kind of foods. Yeah. People, that's to their normal weight. And most males, I don't know, yeah, 250 to 200, most females, 90 to 150, who knows. You can't make these gigantic humans without processed foods. Yeah, well, I, I explain that in my book as an example. I said, I say, if you are uh, grossly overweight and slow in uh, in our prehistoric or uh, Paleolithic period of living, you would have been nothing but a tasty snack is all you would have been. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting, and I think that's the, the goal and for all of us, I hope is that it's about health first and let the weight loss occur naturally. And, and now I know that, you know, a low carb keto paleo, they're kind of terming it is a way to lose fate, weight faster. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's kind of a take on paleo, but obviously it's a low carb, lower carb version. And it's just to accelerate weight loss. What are your thoughts on that? Um. You know, I, first off, the majority of Americans are overweight. We, you know that, Gary. Absolutely. 63, I uh, what, 75% of all Americans are overweight or obese. You know, by the USDA and the CDC, the Centers for D- Disease Control Standards. So, this is nothing new. We all know that we're all fat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's books called Americans, the fattest, you know, people on the planet. So we're all overweight, and, you know, what do we need to do? Well, I'm 63, and, and I remember a time when we weren't all overweight, and you may remember that as well. But 
in the 1970s, yeah. 60s, and 50s, Americans weren't overweight. But what's the difference? Well, we don't, you know, they were a little bit less active, and there's no doubt about that. But I don't know about you, but when I walk through the supermarket in the United States, the middle aisles don't represent anything like I remember when I was a kid. Or even a college student. So, I, I, I think the take home point here is for people that try to get healthier is to walk through the outside aisles and avoid the inside aisle. It's like, you know, let's eat fresh fruits, let's eat veggies, let's eat meat, let's eat eggs, and let's avoid cookies and candies and cereal, all the rest of the crap that is available. Yeah, it's uh that makes sense. No, and it does. It's uh that's the thing. It, we are for the most part not even obese but getting to the morbidly obese uh as a as a majority now. It used to be, you know, around a third, but it's climbing so quickly that I think that's where you know, people have come up with this low carb keto paleo for losing weight faster is to kind of accelerate it. Um so it, I think that's where that movement is coming from. And then you also have the younger paleo crowd who have kind of self-proclaimed themselves as the new paleo experts and have decided to, uh, you know, take it in a different direction. And I think that's where the, the low-carb keto paleo is coming from. But on the other side, some of them are also recommending foods that have not been or have been banned, basically, from the paleo diet, and that is dairy and legumes. Uh, I know Chris Kresser went on Dr. Oz and kind of said that and caused a little stir. What are your thoughts on those uh, foods that they're trying to add in into the paleo diet that were basically not allowed in, in your template? Well, uh, first off, you know, I... I'm not the god of paleo. It's like, I, I think this concept and this idea ought to move forward with humanity and with everybody's input and everybody's ideas. So, uh, you know, the, the notion that, that legumes are not paleo, the notion that dairy is not paleo ought to be examined critically in the scientific literature. And what I can say to people like Chris Presser, who is not a scientist, is that these ideas haven't been examined in the scientific literature. And humans did eat dairy products until very recently, until 10,000 years ago, which may historically seem remote, but it's only about 300 human generations ago. Humans didn't eat legumes because they're toxic unless they're cooked. We didn't have fire until about 300, maybe 250,000 years ago in Europe entirely. The rest of the planet didn't have fire. So until very, very recent times evolutionarily, humans couldn't have consumed legumes and they didn't consume dairy. So what does that leave us? And that's really kind of the model that our group and other scientists from around the world have looked at, is that when you take those two food groups, including processed foods out of the equation, what did humans eat and what did our diet look like? And so that's kind of how we've modeled what contemporary humans should eat when they go to Safeway or the supermarket is that they should avoid these foods. Now, Chris Presser says you can have a little bit of dairy, you can have a little bit of legumes. Yeah, fine. Some people can, some people can't. But we know that legumes and dairy are associated with numerous health problems, and even a little bit doesn't seem to, uh, that seems to hurt some people. So... My point is, is why do it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's interesting. Why, why, yeah. why eat a little bit of poison when you can stay away from it, you know? If you're a, a 
cigarette smoker, why <laughs> why have a few cigarettes? You know, maybe it won't kill you, maybe it won't cause lung cancer or heart disease. But why not stay away from it? There's a lot better things you can do. And so that's really the point, is that there are much healthier ways to eat. And, you know, unless you have this absolute addiction to legumes or dairy, what's the point? You know that, and that's a very good point. And that's uh, it's hard to do. And unfortunately, we never got to speak. Uh, it was all Twitter, and in 144, 45, whatever it is, I don't even know. Um, you can write a sentence basically, and that's what I was trying to explain to Chris. He, I think he took it very personally, but I was just all, you know, Chris. I I outlined in my book that you know, sure, you can you know soak sprout and ferment grains and, and legumes and, and try and make them safer. But I'm all, why do you want to put that much effort and time into a starch and a complex carbohydrate that's still going to cause you harm when you can eat something else that's a lot easier to deal with and process and digest and that, and also that, you know, it, for us in, in the business, it starts to, to complicate the issue and starts to confuse people on what paleo is. And we like to use it, I like to use it as an elimination diet because uh, it has a strict form to it. It has got a little wiggle room, but I like it to use it that way. And once you start telling people that they can add these toxic foods back in and still call it paleo, they don't look at it that way. They look at it and they hear that and they go, oh, I can just keep them in, period. And that was the point I was trying to make to them is we're trying to, to get people healthy, but if we confuse them and we start labeling things that shouldn't be labeled that way, and the example I used is I said, hey, what happens if I stuck Adkins all over my website and all over my books and it's in the title of everything, and then on the inside I'm putting in large pieces of the Cornish diet. Or the Cornish, Ornish diet. There's a lot of corn in it. Um, and I went, that's what happens. I went, that's where people start to get confused. That was my point. Hey, you know, I think you're, you're right on. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to tell people what to eat. I don't want to tell people what not to smoke or what not to drink. You know, we, we live in the 21st century. You can drink alcohol, you can smoke cigarettes, you can smoke pot, you can eat anything you want. But we have the knowledge to not do that stuff. And if you want to do it on an occasional basis, on a recreational basis, that's fine. But don't do it on a daily basis to support health and well-being. Yeah. And I think that's really kind of the, the point that you're making, that I'm making, is that, you know, did you want to have a pot of beans once in a blue moon? Have a pot of beans. If you want to have, you know, a shot of vodka once in a blue moon, do it. But don't do it on a daily basis. And, yeah. and that's really the point, is that this is not something that our genomes, our physiologies are well adapted to. We can do it occasionally. We can get away with it. But we shouldn't be eating legumes or dairy on a daily basis. It's like, and that, that is really the issue. It's like knowing what is healthful and not healthful for the human physiology and avoiding it. And when you do have it, is to realize that it's something that shouldn't be done daily. And I think that's the message that Chris Presser and, and others have God. Yeah. It is that, yes, we agree. This is not a paleo food. Yeah. And yeah. hopefully Chris has enough science behind him to realize that dairy and legumes and beans are not paleo foods. Humans do not eat this stuff. So they do not condition the human gene. We can take a little bit of toxic compounds. We have the liver that has enzymes that can deal with toxicity. And that's fine. But to deliberately do this when you have the option of choosing other foods, it makes very little sense at all. Yeah, and I mean, we are in total agreement. And I think uh, that's what me and some others were actually trying to to relay to Chris is it's like, why would you teach that? And why would you, I, we just didn't get it. And I wasn't telling him, I went, hey, I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm not jumping on you. And actually, a couple people called me a religious zealot. 
for my attitude and I just was all, no, all I'm saying is it's not paleo. It, it, you can't start twisting things and making them your own and then keeping the term in place. And I also told him, if you're going to do that, which I have no problem with, I don't agree with it, but that's fine. That's, hey, that's life. But you need to call it something else and not confuse exactly. people. That's all. Exactly. You know, and, and, and Gary, you, you're spot on. And Keith is as well. And, you know, I support you guys that have been involved in paleo from day one. And, and to me, it's like what we're trying to do, is, it, it's a larger viewpoint. And maybe, you know, Chris, and I'm sure he's involved in it as well, as well. Is, is we want to make people healthier. Yep. But I can tell you, somebody that has autoimmune disease, that has type 2 diabetes, should not be consuming dairy products. Literally, at any level. Yes. And people that, you know, have other health conditions, this is a, a, a very poor piece of advice. And, you know, for Chris Crusher to go on Dr. Oz and say that legumes and dairy are part of the normal paleo diet, that, that really is not the message that I have tried to convey nor have other scientists worldwide that have actually studied this. It's like, this is not part of the gig. And so, yeah. you really done a disservice to us who have spent, I spent 20 years or longer, Stefan Lindbergh at the University of Moon, Jenny Grant Miller at University of Sydney. This is a very, this is a disservice to us all when a person with no academic qualifications comes on board to a program that 20 million Americans watch and they think that this guy is a spokesperson. No, he's not a spokesperson and it's not consistent with the data or the science that we have developed with this concept. Yeah, I just think uh, what happened is he he just handled it poorly. And, and in the interview that he had with uh, with Rob Wolf, you know, he even said he thought of pulling the plug at the 11th hour because he didn't like the way uh, they were fitting that piece in. And the context was kind of, you know, lost. I mean, it, it just was taking everything a little bit out of context. To context and that... You know, but then they started laughing and saying, well, you know, you spend all this time writing a book and you have your opportunity. It's better just to, to get your book out there and have people buy it, even though if you go and say something you don't believe in. I mean, that was the gist of it. And I literally was like, yeah, I was appalled. And here is, I want to give a disclaimer right now, too. Me and Dr. Cordain have never met. We have never spoken beyond email in the last couple days to arrange this interview. And Chris Kresser and Rob Wolf are longtime friends. And Chris Kresser, I gave him an open invitation to be interviewed by me. He, he no response. I've asked Rob Wolf a couple times, uh, not recently because I just gave up. And I, honestly, I really don't care to hear his opinion anymore. Um, to, hey, if you want to come clear clear the air, let's clear the air, and they just won't do it. And that was another problem I had is, hey, if we're going to work together and we're going to go and try and help people, well, let's clarify when we make a mistake or maybe something was taken out of context, but that wasn't the direction they chose to go. And for me, uh, it just, it really put some salt in the wound. And, and that's why I wanted to have you come on and do an interview is just to kind of clear the air and we're not here to bash people. We're not here to uh, necessarily divide, even though I think a divide is coming because I think there's two separate thought processes, which is fine. Hey, that's that's the way it works too. And But that's what I think is most important is that we get the research out there and the science because you're the one who has the decades of experience in this realm. So I thought, well, wouldn't I na naturally interview Dr. Cordain wouldn't it make sense on this subject? I'm going to go to the guy who is considered one of the foremost experts. Why would I not interview him? So, Gary, thank, thank you so much. That's, that's very flattering. And, you know, uh, how do I respond? 
fun. I, I think that people need to evaluate the information. And the way in which we evaluate, ultimately, nutritional information as it relates to health is through randomized controlled trials and animal studies and epidemiologic studies. So I'm going to kind of get into the science of this nonsense, but um, unfortunately, people like Chris Presser, who really doesn't have, and, you know, I'm not faulting him for that. He, he, he simply has not presented his ideas before peer, the peer review process. And so when Lauren Cardain says, that maybe you ought to not eat cereal grains, or you ought to not eat legumes, or you ought to not eat dairy products because they weren't part of the human dietary condition for millions of years. We present data. We look in the archaeological record, we look in the anthropological record, and we look in the, the nutritional and the physiologic record. It's like why humans didn't eat these and what adverse effects they may potentially have. And so it kind of does a great disservice when a person with no academic or scientific credentials comes forth on a place like Dr. Oz or what have you and suggests that, you know, these are foods that we don't have any problems with. Well, where do we draw the line? How about cereal grains? How about refined sugars? How about processed foods? Where do you draw the line? And it's like, who, who defines what is and is not paleo? I don't want to define that. I don't want to be the, you know, the god of paleo that decides that. I want people to read the information and decide for themselves. And so that's really kind of, I think, where this whole thing comes from. And, and that's why I'm very disappointed in that a, a single individual with no actually academic scientific credentials or otherwise can be making these what I consider outrageous statements. <laughs> yeah, well, and on my rant, I had to have a rant uh, that I put on YouTube because I just, my head was going to explode at one point dealing with, Twitter and they wouldn't talk to me. You know, and that was the problem I had is it's like if we're going to have an honest conversation, hey, let's let's air this out. And they just they refuse to do that. And I find that to be actually highly insulting to me in a sense. And well, you know, the, Gary, I'm not sure who they are, but you know, I I've known Rob for ages and, and and Rob is a pretty cool guy and he's a pretty cool head and you know, I didn't listen to what he said about Chris Presser, and I, I haven't followed it, but I, and maybe I should. But you're you're smart because um, they take a couple <laughs> they take a couple digs at you. To be honest with you, Doctor Cordain. You know, it, it, and you expect that. You know, it's kind of like you know when 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 you've been involved in this from day one, that's fine. They can take some digs, but. You know, I like Rob. Rob is a cool guy. He was a graduate student of mine. He came to Colorado State University. And he and I have corresponded over the years. And maybe what he was doing with Chris Crusher was simply, it's kind of like Larry King Live or Oz or anybody else. If you just, you know, throw out ideas and, okay, here's somebody and they're thinking that. But I don't know that... Uh, you know, these kind of ideas are are taken seriously. <laughs> you know? Well, you know what? The scary thing is they actually are. I mean, they've got quite a bit of followers, and people are actually following this. And that's where I get agitated is because they're leading people down the wrong path. And, and I actually, in that rant, I talk about people with no background. That seems to be the new movement. In, in this group is that you don't have to have experience in anything related to health or nutrition because everything that's taught in the mainstream nutrition and wellness world is all wrong anyway. So you're better just to have a blank slate 
and have no education in it whatsoever and I just went off on that because I get hit with that by these guys all the time and I made a clear point to say well that's great and you've read a couple books and you think you're a genius now but you didn't get the biology labs you didn't take biochemistry you didn't take chemistry you didn't take physics you didn't take anything that you really need to have the the backbone and the basic fundamentals to understand uh, the process and that to me is dangerous. It really is. Um, not to say that everyone, I mean, Paul Cech did it, and Paul Cech, but Paul Cech's a brilliant guy. He's an anomaly. <laughs> He's not the norm. And he did it in a different era. He did that, you know, what, 15, 20 years ago. So. I have to tell a funny story about Paul Cech if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Know, regret. I, I'm 63, and I kind of know everybody who's anybody. You know who Paul Cech's wife is? Yeah. Penny. Penny. Yeah. And you know who she did her master's degree with? Uh-oh. Let's hear it. <laughs> Me. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Penny did her master's degree at Colorado State University, and she was one of the brightest things uh, I've ever had. So, uh, uh, and I connected with Penny a few times over the years as Paul became famous and and paleo kind of fell into place. So, uh, you know, when you, you look at the history of it, uh, you realize that, uh, you know, you're kind of, I've been involved with everybody who's anybody. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I try to remain neutral. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, with this, this whole thing that's coming down with the legumes and what have you, it's like, Geez, I wish that Chris Kressler was a graduate student of mine, and he participated in our laboratory and did experiments in our lab. So, yeah. you know, that... And I, and I would love to have a, a conversation with him. Rob and I have conversations regularly. He, he and I have been connected over the years, but, you know, I, I would love to have a conversation conversation with Chris perhaps on your blog and yeah, yeah. you know why don't you do that that would be wonderful it's like it, it, well I don't know if they'll respond to me anymore besides uh I I also I'm out I took myself out of the Twitter chain for the most part I hit it a couple times but I think it's a great idea for us all to get together and really hash it out and talk about it I, I I'm very open to that no problem anyone who knows me in person uh, Dr Corday knows that I tell you what now that you got me on board the yeah. world will listen won't they well like, yeah you, you record my name and. Let's get that out there on your podcast and on your blog. And, uh, you know, I, I, Rob and I, of course, would have no problems. I, Rob and I would talk immediately. But Chris Kresser, I don't, I didn't even know who he was. <laughs> I, you know, I'd heard the name and I didn't know who he was. I mean, I knew of him because he runs in the same, some of the same circles I do, as far as, uh, uh, you know, professional groups and things like that. Right, well, you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're very well known in the paleo community, so, I mean, that goes without saying. I don't know about that. That's very flattering, but people are starting to get to know me. Um, I'm, I'm pretty new as far as jumping in. I've been at this a long time as far as health and working with people, but I come with a completely different background, you know, in law enforcement and the military, but it directly relates, you know, because I was an intelligence right. officer and I did, you know, I worked for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and FDA as an agent. So I know one thing, I know how to investigate and I know how our health care system, food system and drug system works beyond anyone else in our genre. I mean, there's no one with my background. Oh, and, right. I mean, I, and I know that. And, yeah. and it's like when you came to me, it's like I understand that you have this phenomenal background and it's insight. Uh, none of us have that are involved in, in the paleo diet, but yeah, but and that's you mentioned your colleague Heath. <laughs> Heath is so cool, and Heath is involved in this entire thing too. And yeah, and I'm sorry that he didn't wasn't able to be on this podcast, but Heath is is an amazing person, and I think that you two both kind of 
bring a, a new insight into this concept. Well, we're trying, and you know, like I said, I think we're a little older, and uh, than a lot of the people involved right now. Um, you're, you're. I consider, you know, like you're, there's a gap. There's the younger people who are in their early twenties, low thirties. Then there's your group that, you know, were kind of at the forefront and started a lot of it. And me and Heath kind of fit in the middle of those two groups. Uh, and yeah, he's doing some great things on the food side to really put out some really excellent foods for people. We call them, you know, it's a way of bridging the gap is what we call it because it's it, we're so out of touch with food today that to try and go from the standard American diet into, you know, a whole organic based paleolithic primal style of lifestyle right out of the gate is very difficult to do. And we always say that you have to bridge them. You have to give them something in between to take that step. And that's what uh, a lot of his foods are made for. And all of that, but I mean, I, I eat the foods and I'm about as clean as it gets. So, yeah, he's doing some great things. But down uh, the road, maybe, uh, you know, like I said, we'll set something up to where all three of us can discuss some other issues as um, far as, uh, you know, processed foods and, and where they are and where they're hopefully they're going. So, yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out. You know, Terry, I think you're part of the whole thing. And, and, and people that are adopting the paleo lifestyle, it's like they need kind of a bridge. And, you know, what he has done with his company is to help people with, uh, you know, foods that they're normally used to and make them in a manner that are less, you know, unhealthful. So, uh, you know, I, I think between your philosophy and his, is that, you know, we can move this whole idea forward. And that, that's really what I'm talking about. And, yeah. you know, and, and that's really kind of from the very beginning. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to rant or downgrade uh, Chris Kresser. And, 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 you know, of course, Rob and I are good friends. And, you know, I, I think what's more important is establishing to the average person that there is an alternative way in which to eat. It is not low fat, high carb, which, you know, has been, you know, promoted for decades. It's not the USDA, my plate. There is an alternative, and the alternative is to eat healthful foods and non-processed foods. And you can call it paleo, you can call it whatever you want, but that kind of seems to become the earmark of healthy eating in the 21st century. And I'm happy and gratified to be part of it. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it takes on a wide variety of ideas and dimensions. But there are very few of us out there, yourself, and anybody else. Yeah. Crusher, yeah. Anybody. That, that, that says that, look, whole, real, unprocessed foods are the way to go. So that's the message. And I, I don't think we ought to get caught up, you know, in, in, in some of these ridiculous, <laughs> you know, arguments about what is and what is not paleo. So, I I don't know, at my advanced age, <laughs> I'm just saying, let's just get back to the basics and, and, and let's be friends and let's kind of work together and against what was traditionally thought to be helpful eating. Well, and that's what, uh, why I actually put together the Primal Power Method and my books that I'm putting out and I plan to write more and what I'm working on. And I've always told people, um, as I did on a, the Jack Spurko Survival Podcast, I talked about this. I didn't get in this to make money. Trust me, I told people, I went, if I, that was my main goal, it was a horrible goal. 
Um, it's a great way to get poor quickly is to enter a field like this and to expect to be able to make a lot of money. I entered right. it because I'd spent quite a bit of time on the inside. And not only that, but I had been a passionate athlete all my life. And my goal when I left and to start this company was to change this country's view on food and health, period. I mean, it's a lofty goal. It's huge. But I told them, I went, that's my goal, period. I went, you know, well, we can all work together and get this done. I can't do it by myself, and I don't plan to. Um, and I do. I agree. We need to work together and not be divisive um, and kind of uh, move it forward. Um, but with that being said, there are times when you really have to be careful with what you say and to whom and the information you're relaying because there's a lot of people who don't know any different and they take it and they run with it and we don't want to we don't want to harm we want to help um, not to say that he was wrong like i said hey he has his own view i just had issues with the way it was done where it was done and uh, i've also made it clear that when i see something that i don't feel is the right thing and it something needs to be said i'm gonna say it that's just how I am. It's the Irish in me, um, you know. And it just seems to me that's one of the problems in, in our genre, too, is no one will speak up when someone does something like that because they're afraid. They're afraid to get ostracized or, or have the group turn on them and I'm all. That's not how it should be. We need to police our own. And we need to correct them. And when you make a mistake, you go out there and you admit to it. You stand up and, and, and tell people, hey, this is my belief, or correct it. And that's it. And then we're done. Instead, what we have now is we have a drawn out, kind of little tit for tat thing going on. And to be honest with you, Lauren, I'm sick of it. I mean, I'm done. I don't really want to be in this anymore. No, I get it, Gary. I, yeah. And I, I, think, I think what you're saying is, is, is mainstream. A lot of people, you know, agree with you. And we see the same thing. And when we see things like, or come on with, Chris Cresser, who now is turning paleo into something that was never intended to be, you know, eating dairy products, eating beans, eating potatoes, eating processed foods. It's like, that's really not the message. And so I applaud you and Heath and others that are willing to stand up and say, look, you know, this is not how we perceive it. This is not the type of food that we've been eating. This is not the type of food that we've been promoting. And, the, you know, the, the idea that has kind of drawn worldwide interest. So, you know, many thanks to you and, and, and Heath and, and people in your community uh, for supporting me and... Uh, you know, I, I I think people need to think for themselves, and that's the bottom line. They shouldn't yeah. listen to you. They shouldn't listen I agree. to me. They shouldn't listen to anybody else. They should listen to the best available data. Well, I, I, I call it, uh, I tell them it's about self-sufficiency. Um, I may provide something for them to educate themselves and follow, but they have to make the ultimate decision. And I'm not going to make it for them. I'm not that person. I'm not that arrogant to think that I'm the all-knowing. If anything, I call myself the, the common man's kind of ancestral health slash primal guy because my writings are very basic and very general. Um, and I do it that way because I feel that I'm not writing and giving my education out to my peers. I'm giving it to the common person who doesn't know anything. I don't need to impress my peers. I don't care about that. Um, I'm old enough. I, you know, my ego is, is is almost non-existent anymore. I mean, do I have some pride? Yes, but my ego is more. I put it in check and go. It's about helping people. And how can I do that? You know, um, and that's how I believe. And yeah, it's uh, we're on the same page. You know, so with that, what, what do you think? Uh, where do you think the future of paleo is going in the near and distant future? Well, Gary, thank you so much for having me on your show and your podcast. And let me just kind of you know, finish this up with yep. 
hopefully a, a little bit of uh, inner advice, <laughs> having been involved in this for, <laughs> from the very beginning uh, for 25 years. But where is paleo going? I think it's going in a very good direction. I am very happy about what I have seen, and I think that um, the way people in the world saw this concept was first kind of just sad. It's like, you know, the latest Beverly Hills great food diet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, you know, whatever. It's like some, some kind of diet that somebody invented, you know. I didn't invent it. Boyd Eaton didn't invent it. Rob Wolf didn't invent it. Uh, Chris Cresser didn't invent it. None of us invented it. What we have done is we have uncovered the way in which human species, our species, have eaten over the course of millions of years. These are the evolutionary pressures that shape our genome. And there was no single paleo diet. There was a, a range of diets that our ancestors ate. And when we recognize this, and we try to shape our diet, our modern diets under that category of the range of diets that we ate in, we do better. Yeah. Our health improves. Yeah. We do not develop obesity. We do not develop type 2 diabetes. We do not develop heart disease or cancer. We do not develop autoimmune disease. For the most part, we can't escape those things completely. That's the nature of our species. But when we eat in a manner that mimics the nutritional characteristics of our ancestors and we eat fresh fruits, vegetables, meat, seafood, fish, nuts, eggs, what have you, and we avoid refined sugars, refined flours, refined vegetable oils, processed foods, refined vegetable oils. As a species, as a group, we all do better. We don't all escape those diseases, but most of us do. And that's the take-home message. And so uh, I, I will leave you with that, Gary. Well, and that's the message: is let's eat real living foods and let's avoid processed foods, and we're going to all be in better shape. Yeah, and uh, I one hundred percent agree, and I think we're all trying to do the right thing. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and clarifying uh, some of the recent issues that uh, popped up. And uh, I hope to do it again sometime. Hey, it's been my pleasure, and uh, thank you so much for having me on. And, uh, you know, you are a real asset to the, uh, the Internet community because that's how messages are delivered. And I know that uh, this podcast or broadcast or however you want to do it will go out to millions, and uh, I hope that people will think about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.